How about those Cowboys, Adrian? Can't say anything, but they had a wildly successful last year. And honestly, the Cowboys, a lot of their success is coming in the draft. Brendan Albert here, leader in FedQ, ready to talk about the Cowboys and talk about that 2017 prediction for him. Oh, how about those cockroaches? You know, 13-3 and three last year, got to give them some credit. It wasn't a fluke, people. This team's actually pretty good. Uh, we're going to get into it right now. I, I want to start with Zeke. I want to start with the whole suspension now. We're, we're two guys. We're, we're not going to get into the, all the semantics and, and, and everything about what happened with the girl and all that. But what we will get into is how much the suspension actually hurts the Cowboys. So, so how much does losing Zeke hurt this team for the first? games of the year yeah i mean let's let's first talk about the first couple games of the year not cupcakes to start the year so the games that currently zeke would be suspended for is home versus home versus the giants at denver at arizona the rams i don't think that makes too much of a difference but you always want your best players there and then the packers so i mean you look at it right there look the giants are absolutely a team who can win their division the broncos are a very very good team potentially a wild card team Arizona and the Rams, probably two teams on the decline. And the Packers are a team who absolutely could be a Super Bowl contender. So right there, you're looking at a lot of high, high volume quantity of opponents right off the bat. And then here's some other things you need to keep in mind. Zeke was the only player in Dallas to have more than 100 carries. He had 322. The next most guy was Alfred Morris with 69 carries. So you're losing a huge drop in opportunities. Now, obviously, Adrian, Alfred Morris and DMC, we pretty much know what they are. I mean, they're okay, solid guys. But, I mean, when you have Zeke back there, he's a whole nother level of athlete. Here's the thing, too. Like, people make the argument. It's like, well, they got Alfred Morris, Derek McFadden. They have that offensive line. They can just plug in whoever, and it's going to work. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Zeke averaged .8 yards more than the rest of his teammates last year. That, that's that's pretty much a whole yard, all right? And you, and you gave me the stat in Pittsburgh. Uh, Le'Veon Bell only averaged 0.2 yards more than the rest of the back. So, you know, just a, a huge difference in, in production there. And uh, I, I think it does make a difference. I don't think Alfred Morris or Derek McFadden are just going to – come in there and and be not not going to say that they're going to be it's going to be the same production but but let's not kid ourselves here a hundred percent I mean look I know Dallas obviously was more of a ball control offense than a uh you know run and gun throw the ball over the place you know offense last year but they're probably gonna have to even go more of a ball control offense I think when you're looking at you know obviously the Zeke suspension inserting McFadden and Alfred Morris yeah, you know what? Behind that offensive line, I don't think you guys are wrong. I think they're still going to be a very successful run unit, especially because Dallas has said, we're going to run the football. Look, we're not going to go spread heavy. They're not one of those teams who's devaluing the fullback, who's throwing the ball more and more. They're one of those teams who's saying, no, we actually want to run the ball more. All right? So when you look at things, Dallas is still of that 90s mentality where we're seeing more and more teams go spread. Dallas is saying, hey, we still want to be physical. So I don't think necessarily when they have Zeke, they're all of a sudden going to say, all right, let's just go empty and start throwing the ball all over the place. That's not what they're going to do. They're still going to run the ball. I'm just curious, are they going to be as effective on first and second down? Yeah, it's and it's crazy the production that he had and the amount of snaps he had. So, you know, we remember the DeMarco Murray uh, season that he had from a couple of years ago. So he had 782 snaps and, and Zeke had 716. And this was his rookie season. So that's insane. Led the league in rushing, 1,631 yards. Um, yeah, so, so he's got that natural forward lean. He makes uh, – he just, he just rumbles uh, for yardage. I mean, you, you just can't bring him down. And I think where this hurts the Cowboys too is it, it hurts Dak Prescott. I mean, when, when, you're, when you're running the ball, averaging five yards per carry, and you're just rumbling down defenses, play action. It opens up everything. So now, now you're gonna have Alfred Morris, Darren McFadden in there. Okay, sure, yeah, you guys can say, oh, they're gonna average just about the same, but it's not gonna help with the play action as much. I agree with you, Adrian. I mean, I think really where it's gonna affect is last year, Dak faced a lot of third and four, third and fives. This year, I think he's probably gonna face more third and six and longer. So yeah. when you look at what that difference is, I know everyone's like, oh, well, it's two yards. Well, realistically. Two yards as a defensive coach, that completely changes what you call. You know, third and four, 
as a defensive coach, you're thinking, hey, this could be a run or a pass. Third and six, I'm saying, no, we got a passing situation here. So certainly that's going to, you know, lighten that box up for Dak. So it is going to be kind of a little more of a spotlight on him. But I'll give you another stat. One of the other things that, you know, is pretty rare in the NFL, we know that most teams are throwing the ball more than running, not Dallas. Dallas actually on the year ran the ball 20 more times than passed it. So I know a lot of people are like, well, that doesn't probably mean a lot. Well, it does, again, because what Dallas did a great job with, and everyone and Eagles fans and anyone who wants to doubt on Dak, I get it. You can completely say, hey, you know, he was only successful because they were so successful on first and second down with running the football. You're not wrong. So at the same time, Dak, spotlight's on you, man. We got to see what can you do to kind of lighten the box up a little bit. Yeah, let's get into Dak Prescott and what he did his rookie season and all that stuff. So do you think he's a fluke? No, 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 no. Dak's not a fluke, all right? So I think the word fluke is not fair. Is he going to be as successful? No, I don't think so this year. Yeah, I, I can agree with that. I mean, I – Obviously, there's going to be a drop-off. We can't expect what he did last year. I mean, what he did last year was just unprecedented for a rookie quarterback. And even for him to take a step back, he'll still put up better numbers than normal second-year quarterbacks, I believe, in my opinion. When he came out of Mississippi State, he reminded me a little bit of Russell Wilson. I liked that coming out. And he was the guy that I wanted the Eagles to target in the middle rounds, potentially. And then, and then obviously, he gets drafted to Dallas, and, and look at what he did. Um, I, I do think that he benefits from Zeke, and I do think he benefits from the offensive line. But at the same time, he's still making the throws, he's still making the plays, and he's still putting the ball on the money, and he's making the proper decisions. So as a game manager, he did a very, very, very good job as a rookie quarterback. Without a question. I mean, here's the thing. If, you, if you're if you of that mindset that you say, oh, well, Dak was unsuccessful because of the offense and because of play calling and all that, that's fine. But you know what he didn't do? He didn't hurt the team. Only four yep. interceptions. You know where that ranks him, Adrian? 35th in the NFL. That means they were literally guys who were backups in the NFL who didn't even start the full season, who had more interceptions. And also, Dak only had four fumbles. So, yeah, you know what? We use the word game manager. I don't care. Look, I, I don't care if he's a game manager or an elite-level quarterback. If he's winning the game, that's what matters, isn't it? He did a great job. And, I, you know, I, I will say this. Like, I want to see him face a blitz. I want to see him, you know, handle some pressure. Because at Mississippi State, I didn't think he handled pressure well. And he doesn't have to deal with that all the time in Dallas because he, he gets he gets to stand back there for 10 seconds. And, and go, man, he can go through progressions in the stands if he wants to. Uh, but but so that, that's what I want to see. And, you know, that's where I want to see in his progression. Can he handle a blitz? Can he handle all that? That's, and I think that's that's, my... that's that's all really fair. But I think if, if we're going to be the if we're going to be the mindset of, hey, we want to give more credit to the offensive line and the running game. That's completely fair. If you want to take a little bit of that credit and give it there and less credit to Dak, I'm okay with that. But let me just kind of share full numbers with you so we're all on the same page when we're talking about Dak. 35th in the league, as I mentioned, in interceptions, which is fantastic. So that's outstanding. Fourth in yards per attempt. Yes, a lot of that's play action set up by the success of the run game, but he's still not Charlie Checkdown, so he's not afraid to throw the ball down the field. 23rd in attempts. Yes, he had nets, and that's the fair knock on Dak. He was 23rd in attempts, and because we obviously are an Eagles-based show, he had 150 less attempts than Carson Wentz. So that's a very, very fair thing to kind of concern yourself about Dak. He was 19th in the league in yards, but here's the thing I love about him. He was third in the NFL in QB rating, okay? So to me, that's very, very important because that tells me, obviously, yes, we're not asking you to throw the ball as often. We're not asking you to put you in third and long situations. But when you're third in the NFL in ratings, that's telling me when we are asking to throw the ball, you're really freaking effective. So to me, no, Dak's not a fluke. Is his numbers going to drop down? He's not going to be a pro bowler next year, I don't think anyway. But he's still going to be a damn good starting quarterback in the NFL moving forward. I completely agree. And, you know, a lot of people in Philadelphia, they want to doubt. They want to say he's a fluke. They want to say all that. But from what I saw – I don't think he's a fluke. Sure, he benefited from a lot of things, but he still made the plays as well. You know, who, who was their quarterback the year before? 
when Tony Romo got hurt. He couldn't do shit. Who I couldn't even tell you what Brandon Whedon. Yeah, exactly. So it's, and you, and you it's not what? like you can. It's not like you can just throw anybody back there and he's going to be successful. Mm-hmm. Dak Prescott did what what they quarterback could not do in Dallas last year. Whoever they were, whoever they were tossing out there. One hundred percent right, Adrian. Because even before you know Dak Prescott and Zeke showed up. They still had, you know, a Pro Bowl running back there in DeMarco Murray went behind that offensive line. And whoever that quarterback was, and they had a little bit of rotation situation, like Brandon Whedon, as you mentioned, was in that rotation. They weren't this successful. Now, the big thing that everyone's going to say is, well, if Carson Wentz was in Dallas, he'd be as successful. I'm not 100% set on saying that. And I say that because of the turnovers and the QB rating. Obviously, we're comparing apples to oranges. And realistically, you know what, guys? We'll never really know definitively if that if that would be true or false. But, I mean, look, if the guys only turn the ball over eight times, we know Carson struggled to turn the ball over towards the end of the season. I like Dak a lot. I mean, he, he is doing exactly what he's asked, maybe a little more. But I don't think he's going to be as successful as next season. But still a good starting quarterback in the NFL. You know, Eagles fans may disagree with what I'm about to say. I think Dak fits that offense better than what Carson does. But I think Carson Wentz fits this offense in Philly better than what Dak does. I, th- I think Dak is that game manager type, smart IQ, football IQ. I mean, Wentz has it too. But Wentz has more of that gunslinger mentality. And, and he's going to force the ball into spots that Dak isn't going to. Dak doesn't have the arm strength that Carson Wentz does. Um, but they, they both have the intelligence but uh, Carson does take more chances, and uh, he would throw more turnovers I, or more interceptions in Dallas. He'd also throw more touchdowns, though, I think. Yeah, I think, I think that's all really fair, Adrian. No disagreements here on that. All right, so the big question in Philly is – well, the big debate is, is who's going to have the more prosperous career, Dak Prescott or Carson Wentz? What do you think? Oh, give me Dak Prescott. And, and, and the reason I'm saying Ooh, that is because, oh, wait. Okay. look, I, I mean, I, I'm saying, look, I have a future Hall of Famer in Des Bryant there, a future Hall of Famer in Jason Witten, a unbelievable talent in Ezekiel Elliott that the only person who's able to stop Zeke is Zeke. I have three Pro Bowl offensive linemen in Dallas. Yeah, give me that all day. I mean, look, obviously I know what Philly is moving in the right direction, I'm not doubting it. I'm merely saying the supporting cast of what Dak has is way better than, a, than a what, you know, is, if Philly, Philly is not nearly as good as what Dallas has. So of the future, yeah, give me, give me Dak because I know what's around him. I don't know definitively what's around, you know, Carson Wentz. As a talent, though, you think Dak Prescott's better? No, I, I would probably say Carson Wentz has a higher ceiling. Oh, that's, that's where I'm getting at. Oh, that's okay. Then I would say, yeah, Carson Wentz has a higher ceiling. I, I think Dak probably has a little more to grow. But I think the uh, Russell Wilson is probably the ceiling for Dak. Now, obviously, that's a damn good ceiling when I'm able to drop a <laughs> quarterback in there. But I think Carson Wentz has a higher ceiling. I think that's fair. But for what they've got around him, Dak's probably going to be more successful in the next year to two. Carson might be more successful in the next three to five. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, I I think Carson has the higher ceiling. I I think he's got more physical talent, but I at the same time I don't think Dak is that far behind. I I think he's right there. It's he's in the discussion. It's that it's not like Philly Philly fans. A lot of Philly fans don't want to admit that Dak Prescott's a good quarterback. They don't want to admit it, but he's good. He's very good, and we're gonna have to deal with him for the next decade. Him and Zeke. So just get used to it. 100% right. And, and and I think that's what's really cool about this rivalry is they both have drafted future quarterbacks or, you know, for their teams moving forward. I would say right now, and we'll talk a little more about this when we go position by position, but I really like what Dallas is doing in the draft the last couple of years too. Yeah, they've, they've been killing the draft. Some of the Eagles haven't been done, doing it in a decade. Uh, so 13-3 and three last year. 13-3. and three. Was it a little flukish? Well, I mean, here's the thing. They rattled off 11 straight wins last year, all right? So I'm not ready to say they're going to go on an 11-win streak again. Honestly, if you told any team in the NFL, I said, hey, look, what's the odds you think your teams can go win 11 straight games with a mid-round rookie starting quarterback and a really good starting running back as a rookie too? 
I think any team in the NFL would believe this, that you could win 11 straight games. So do I think the Cowboys are quote, quote, fluke? No, they're certainly talented. But 11 straight wins, that was a, that was a tall order. I don't think that's going to be something they're going to be able to rattle off again this year. I, I think they're a very good team. I don't have them being a playoff team this year. That schedule is ridiculously brutal. And if you have Zeke suspended, it, they're, they're kind of screwed. Uh, I think this suspension is going to get reduced. And I, I'm not, I, I don't know if this is true, but something that I've heard, it's going to get reduced to two games. That's, that's what I'm hearing. I don't know if this is going to happen or not. But they, it's supposed to come out tomorrow, correct? The the okay, so tomorrow we'll find out uh, just how many games it is. I heard two. I I thought it would go back to four, so that that was my thinking. I but, think okay. that's fair. I I think that's fair, Adrian. I mean, the problem with the NFL is that yeah. it is literally a moving walking stick in terms of how do we deem players who are suspended for domestic violence or. How do we give this or how do we give that? And then it goes right back to the same person who make the decision to remake the decision. It's a really wacky situation. Um, honestly, I have no idea what's going to happen with Zeke. The big thing that we've heard, though, is the NFL has yeah. said, look, if a player comes to us and is apologetic and admits fault, we are more likely to kind of meet in the middle ground. And if Zeke turns and says, look, I didn't do this and I fight this, I think the NFL is more likely to dig their heels in and probably either not give, not move the suspension at all or maybe move it only to four games. But the one thing I will say is if Zeke goes that route and Adam Lee denies it, and you know what, realistically, maybe he's telling the truth. Okay, let's give him credit. Maybe he is. But if he's not lying about this, you are the scum of the earth, man, and you deserve every bad thing that comes to you. There you go. All right. I'm not going to comment on it. Um, I just wanted to say, you know, what I heard. So that's it. I don't like talking about shit like this. Like, the, I'm a football guy. This isn't for me to talk about. This is for fake news outlets like Fox News and all that for people to talk about. That's for them. <laughs> all right. Uh, okay, so back to the fluke argument thing. Okay, so I have the Cowboys going 8-8 eight and eight this year. But it's not because they were a fluke last year. It's, it's, it's because of the schedule. The schedule is... They, I, I think they have the hardest schedule in the league. Like, literally. It, it, it's ridiculously difficult. Uh, I like their style of play, and it works for them. And here's why. So, so when you're slow and methodical offensively, and you're able to chop up the clock, and you're able to rest your defense, resting the defense is key, because it's not really a great defense. Okay? So it's not a great defense. But Rod Marinelli is a magician. And I want to talk about him just a little bit right now. So, Brendan, you know, like, we Cowboys fans, or we Eagles fans, we're like, well, this Cowboys defense, it stinks. And you know what? You're right. But they got Rod Marinelli, and he always makes them average somehow. You know what? Dallas's defense has stunk since the 90s, and somehow they've still been productive. I mean, realistically, like, <clears throat> if I rattled off 30, the 32 starters there in the Cowboys, 32 star- starters in the Saints, the 32 starters and some other bad defenses. I'm not sure that, you know, you're not going to pick a couple guys from these other teams. Like realistically, they have a stable of average edge rushers. Now the defensive backs is a ton of youth. there. linebackers is meh, whatever. Sean Lee has seemed to stop getting injured every six minutes. So I guess that's the good news. So, you know, in Dallas, their defense, you know what? They're not good. They're, they're not that sexy big name, but you know what? They haven't been. And I don't think they're ever going to be per se. But as you mentioned, Adrian, they run the ball control offense, keep the defense on the sidelines, minimize the opportunities they have to be on the, on the field, and just try to execute, keep everything in front of them, and make the defense go long drives and beat you with 15-plus play drives. They don't let a lot of teams beat them with under you know seven play drives. That's what Dallas is. So you know, from what they have as a defensive staff, I would argue as a coaching staff, they're very, very underrated because – they're able to win games that realistically they shouldn't on paper because their defense just isn't that good. Yet you can't deny they're very effective with what little talent they have. It's unbelievable. I don't know how they do it. They do it every year. They literally do it every year. And every year, Eagles fans say the same fucking thing. Well, this Cowboys defense, it sucks. It's, it's terrible. And you're right. 
But Rod does magic, magical things. I don't know what he does. He, eh, it's unbelievable. All right, let's go position by position. We went, we talked about quarterback exclusively, so we don't need to get into Dak. Running back, uh, we kind of went into that too. So let's let's get into Des Bryant. He took a drop off last year. What's going on with him? I mean, a rookie quarterback is what's going on with him. And, you know, and he's had a lot of injury problems too. He hasn't really been able to stay on the field consistently. You know, so that certainly takes a, a, a big drop. So, yeah, I mean, there's a bit of a drop off there, you know, from your one receiver. Before I talk about receivers, I want to talk about quarterbacks really quick here because obviously we know, we know about Dak. And then we also know they just re- they moved on from Kellen Moore last year, who honestly, he looked like the worst backup in the NFL in preseason. <laughs> yeah. By a lot. Like, really, really bad. So they moved on from him from the 53, which means that there is no more left-handed quarterbacks in the NFL. He was the last one. So their backup quarterback is an undrafted rookie in Cooper Rush from Central Michigan. So there is not a good backup situation at all here in Dallas. The guys I'm thinking about here in Dallas, I could realistically see them going back after Brandon Whedon. I think that's a very realistic fit fit for them. That's someone they've, you know, they've showed that the uh, the opportunity has been there in the past before. And then they also, realistically, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but it does make sense. There's a need there, and realistically, if Dak goes down, you need to still win games. Colin Kaepernick would make a ton of sense for the Cowboys to circle if Kaepernick is understanding that you are always going to be the backup unless something goes down with Dak because you know what? The rest of the roster is really freaking good. They need a backup quarterback. The other option they could go, if they go with Josh Johnson, a guy who got released, I believe, from the Giants. He was battling out Geno Smith for that backup job. So there's some rotational backup guys in the league that are out there. But look, the quarterback position in Dallas, you need a backup. You really do because I am nowhere near ready to say that Cooper Russ is ready to be your solidified starter, especially because Dallas only played three preseason games. They got that one canceled versus Houston, which honestly for Cooper Rush, that's a big deal. He needed that. So him missing that, I am very, very worried about the quarterback situation in Dallas behind Dak. Did they play three or did they, they play four because of that first game? Did they, cut, did they still play five if you play the Hall of Fame game? No, I'm pretty sure the Hall of Fame game counts as one. Let me pull it up really quick. I'm, I'm almost positive. Well, well, it, I, if, if you normally play the Hall of Fame game, you normally have five preseason games. Hmm. Okay. I stand corrected then. Yep, you're right. So I think so. They had Arizona. They had the Rams, the Colts, the Raiders. So they missed the Texans. Either way, realistically, Cooper Rush needed that one. I mean, like, yes. every snap he gets, he needed it. So him not getting that one more one more opportunity to go out there and show it, that's a big issue there. So either way, if I'm Dallas, I am very aggressive trying to find a backup quarterback. Dude, honestly, Kyle Kaepernick, Dallas, that's that's where he should go. Like they they media scrutiny in Dallas, Dallas signing Kyle Kaepernick, that's like that's like that's nothing for them. That's nothing for Jerry Jones. No, I mean Jerry Jones Jerry Jones controls every single bit of that Cowboys organization. So realistically, if Jerry Jones wants him, there's no like, hey, let's consult PR. Jerry Jones is like, I am PR. I am the <laughs> manager. Like, I make every decision. So, like, I would be okay with it. And realistically, when we talk about Cap's skill set, when the Niners went to the Super Bowl, how did they do it? Ball control offense, winning, winning first and second down with running, easy third down passing. That's exactly what Dallas is. So, Kaepernick would be a great signing there in Dallas. And I'm telling you, if Dak goes down – Burn the ships, man, because your Cowboys season is over. I'm, I'm, that's where he's going, dude. Colin Kaepernick's going to Dallas. It's happening. I, they, we're, we just started that trend. It's going to happen. It just makes uh, I, 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 it, it makes a lot of sense because it, you said the ball control offense, but I'm also thinking like to myself, well, they have that great offensive line, they, and, and, it's, and, and it's not like you're worried about him getting injured because he's your backup. So run the fuck out of him. I mean, realistically, I mean, here's the thing. Look at, like, Carolina, okay? When Cam goes down, the entire offense changes because Derek Anderson yeah. is nowhere near the same physical skill set as Cam. But if you bring in Cap, Cap's skill set is very similar to Dak. Has the ability to kind of make throws on the run. Cap's obviously a far better runner with the ball in his hands. 
But as you said, Adrian, he's a backup. So you know what? If he starts running around and he gets hurt, okay. He got hurt. He's a backup. Big deal. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's go to – well, we don't need to get into running backs. We talked about Dez. Uh, I want to get into Colt Beasley because that, that was – Dak's security blanket last year had 75 receptions. Cole Beasley, man, he's as shifty in the slot as they come. He is. I mean, he he was one of the highest guys and targets in the NFL from the slot. Cole Beasley had a fantastic year. After the Cowboys re-signed, uh, was it uh, Terrence Williams there as the other number two receiver? Cole Beasley went out and out, out produced him. And so, you know, a lot of people, you know, a lot of times when you think of rookie quarterbacks, a lot of people think, oh, the tight end is a really great position for him to target for rookie quarterbacks or having a good running back out of the backfield. Slot receivers are too. And Cole Beasley had a wildly successful year with, as you said, Adrian, 75, uh, 75 receptions. He also had five touchdowns. That's more touchdowns than Jason Witten last year and more receptions than Jason Witten last year. Cole Beasley had a really, really nice year in that slot. Yeah, and, and he likes using uh, the change of space, uh, the change of pace. I mean, that touchdown he had against Green Bay where he's just he's just lolling the corner, cornerback to sleep, and then he, then he just, whoop, darts. Yeah, and, and you know what? The Cowboys saw that, and they doubled down on slot receivers, and they went out and they drafted Ryan Switzer, whose skill set is yeah. very, very – Basically a clone. Yeah. Yeah, and I also like Bryce Butler. Uh, he's been looking good for them. And quite frankly, I think he's probably better than Terrence Williams, who I think he sucks. I don't so think not... Terrence Williams is a, is a number two in the NFL, but you know what? We just rattled off five receivers in Dallas. That's pretty damn good a receiving core to have. Yeah, and they got Dez. So, uh, Dez still that big physical guy that he still is. So um, I still have him as a top ten receiver. He's on the back end of my top ten, but he's still up there. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's absolutely a top ten guy. Has he declined a little bit? Sure. But – most people do with age realistically. And that's also because we've seen guys like Mike Evans come in the league. I mean, he's been taken off. I mean, you probably even could say Michael Thomas, you know, out of new Orleans, he's probably a guy who's ahead of him right now after one season, but Dez has been nothing but successful over his career. So it's a great, great weapons crew there in Dallas. And you still have Mr. Reliable in a first ballot hall of famer and Jason Witten too. Yeah. All right. Let's get into the offensive line. For the first time in a couple years, there's actually some questions. Not really major questions, but there's some questions because there's been some changes. So Doug Free has retired. So you so you move Layout Collins from left guard to right tackle. So he's at playing at right tackle. He got his extension. Jonathan Cooper now instead of Ronald Leary. So is this going to work? Well, here's the thing. The good news is in this situation of the five starters on Dallas's offensive line, the three that were Pro Bowlers all are back. So that's the good news. I mean, they had five. They had five Pro Bowlers last year. Zeke and Dak were the other ones, and then the three offensive linemen. So that's the good news. You have three returning Pro Bowl level offensive linemen. They're all elite at what they do. So realistically, if your other two offensive linemen now are Jonathan Cooper, a guy who's you know, still a little bit of a um, struggling to kind of really show his skill set. When he came out of North Carolina, he was the best offensive lineman. He's just struggled in the NFL. And some guys takes time. Hopefully it clicks for him. But you know what? If he goes somewhere where he's really expected to be the fourth best offensive lineman on the team, that's an okay situation. And then you move Lionel Collins, a guy who played right guard most of his career, to right tackle. I'm okay with it because he was a guy who showed a lot of upside there at right guard. Moving to right tackle? Okay. I think this is a really good offensive line. Not the best in the offensive line, the NFL, but a very good unit still. I still have him as the best, but it's not. But the gap has shrunk. Who do you have as the best? Titans, man. I'm absolutely going with Titans' best offensive line in the NFL. And I think actually the Eagles' offensive line is better than Dallas. I have Dallas as the third best offensive line in the NFL. Oh, wow. You love the Eagles one. Okay. All right. I mean, I, I mean, to me, my value it, when I look at o- offensive lines, it starts with the tackles. So if you have really good tackles, to me, that's that is more important than guards. I love Zach Martin. There's no doubt that Zach Martin is a better offensive lineman than what anything the Eagles have. However, when you have a really good left tackle and a damn good right tackle in Philly, that's more important to me than a really elite level left tackle and a guy who we're not confident can be an elite level right tackle in Dallas. So. I take the Phil, I take Philly over Dallas, but 
realistically, that's just because it's, you know, start of the year. Dallas absolutely could start firing away and say, nope, they're still at an elite level and probably better than Philly. But all three of those are awesome, awesome, awesome offensive lines in the NFL. Here's, here's what I will say. And, and Dallas fans should be concerned because they have no depth on that O-line. If somebody gets hurt, they're screwed. And they haven't had to deal with any injuries along their offensive line. They have been healthy. They have been, you know, they haven't had any injuries the last three years. I mean, you're 100% right, Adrian. And you know what? It only takes it, it takes a quick second for an offensive lineman to get rolled up on, and boom, there's an ankle or a knee or, or something like that goes down. Happens all the time in the NFL. And you know what? To be fair, when Dallas is running off those 11 straight wins, injury bug didn't bite him at all. And, you know, obviously when we're predicting records, we can't predict injuries. We, we, just, we just don't have that ability. But it's not a stretch to say that maybe this is a year that Dallas gets bit with the injury bug. I mean, as I talked about with Sean Lee, two years where he hasn't been on the IR, which is the good news. But he has been yeah. a year, year before that. So that's not the good news. Yeah. All right. Uh, man, I, dude, every show I always forget to talk about the tight ends. I don't know why. I just always like seem to neglect it. Uh, but Jason Witten still uh, – you know, he, well, here's what's happening now. He's more of a blocking tight end now. He's always been a blocking tight end, but they're using him less and less in the receiving game. He's still productive, I think. Yeah, I mean, Jason Witten really has never been a move tight end. He's never been Antonio Gates or Jordan Reed. That's never been his skill set. He's always been more of the physical inline tight end, working a lot of stick concept, a lot of post concept. He's never been the guy to say, hey, let's split him out as an X and have him win one-on-one -on -one with a corner. That's never been his skill set. But he's still unbelievable at what he does at his age. Still a guy who's capable of rattling off 70 receptions and five, five touchdowns a year. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's move on to the defensive line. So, I mean, you talked about it, average defensive ends. Tyrone Crawford, Demarcus Lawrence, they drafted Taco Charlton out of Michigan with their first-round pick. He hasn't really shown much uh, so far. I'll, I'll say this about the interior. I really like Malik Collins. He was a third-round pick for them last year. And, God damn, dude, you know, you talk about that draft. I guess we could get into that discussion right now. Last year's NFL draft that they had might have been – is it is it fair to say it was the best ever? Because, I mean, saying the best ever is, is a strong fucking thing. And I, I don't have any other drafts in front of me. But last year, it's, it's not only Dak Prescott. It's not only Ezekiel Elliott. It's Anthony Brown. It's, it's Malik Collins. Were exceptional. Well, I think you're fair in saying that it's not fair for us to say the best ever. I think you need to revisit this type of thing. You always revisit drafts like five years, you know, kind of removed. But let us let me rattle yeah. off who they, who they had. Zeke was their first-round pick, stud. Jalen Smith, they drafted him knowing he had some nerve damage. Very similar to what Sharif Floyd is going through in Minnesota, and unfortunately looks like it might cost Sharif Floyd his career. Jalen Collins is slowly starting to put it together. And, yeah. look, realistically, if he didn't have that injury against Ohio State in the Fiesta Bowl, he would have been a top-10 pick. So they got him in the second round. Oh. I hear why you did it. Malik Collins had five sacks as a rookie. That's pretty damn productive. Chris Trapper, Chris Trapper is a DN, another one of those guys they have in the mix at the DN rotation. Didn't play at all last year because of a back injury. So, you know, Jerry still outed him. Then they went out and got Dak, you know, just, just a rookie pro bowler from a fourth-round pick. <laughs> okay, pretty damn good. And then add Anthony Brown, a sixth-round pick out of Purdue who ended up starting a lot of games and realistically – He's the reason they didn't re-sign Mo Claiborne and Brandon Carr because Anthony Brown looks so damn good. So right there, yep. you're looking at, let's see here, Zeke's solid starter, Dak, solid starter, Malik Collins, solid starter, Anthony Brown, solid starter, Jalen Smith, all right, so let's say four and a half because I don't think anyone's really confident to say Jalen Smith's definitely going to be a stud yet. And same thing with Chris Trapper. So of those six guys I looked at, you potentially could have six starters for the next five years in Dallas, which is super rare for a draft. That was a fantastic draft situation that Dallas went into. Unbelievable. And it's like Collins is your best defensive tackle. Anthony Brown's your best cornerback. Obviously, we know Zeke and, and Dak. So, man, they really killed it last year. And I, I thought they had a good draft this year, too. So they basically did what Philly did. They went edge rusher, corner, corner, and then, you know, just filled out the rest of their board. So that's what they did. 
They did, Adrian. And really, if you think about it, let's go a couple years back when they had Johnny Menzel on the board. And yeah. all reports were that Jerry really wanted Johnny. But the office convinced him, no, go sack Martin. And they opted not to do it. Same thing happened in 2016 when they were rumored to trade up to get Paxton Lynch. And, and everyone heard Jerry really wanted to do it. And the rest of the office said, no, sit back and wait. And they ended up getting Dak. So realistically, if you look at what the, the uh, Cowboys have done, they've been patient with the quarterback position. They've taken the best player available everywhere. And then they hit a home run with Dak Prescott in the mid, in the mid round, similar to what Seattle did for years yeah. the best player available and eventually we'll hit on a quarterback and they did so when we're looking coming full circle now to what this defensive line unit is I don't think Malik Collins is a pro bowl level caliber guy at least not yet but you can't deny five sacks as a rookie was really freaking good considering you know you look at the guy who led it he had nine and a half so five sacks isn't terribly far off as a rookie and the rest is that defensive line group you bring in Taco Taco Charlton all right, let's see what he does. I mean, he's just another guy who can rotate. Maybe he's productive. Maybe not. Yeah. Lawrence, Crawford, and then they have, uh, was it Mayo, the guy who led the team with sacks of six. So there's a lot of rotation guys, and then you realistically you have two rookie DNs and Chris Trapper who didn't play at all in 16, and then Taco Charlton. So there's a lot of optimism. You could argue that defensive line group, but I also could say there's nothing that makes me feel solidified, confident this is a great defensive line group either. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. you know, like Ty Tyron Crawford and Demarcus Lawrence have both flashed, but they've also shown that they're just kind of average at the end of the day. So, you know, that's where it is. Uh, all right, let's move on to linebackers. Sean Lee, uh, we find out Anthony Hitchens, is he's out for the year, correct? Mm -hmm. Oh, man, that's that's a loss for them. Uh, Damian Wilson, uh, another guy. So Jalen Smith, I'll, I'll ask you about Jalen Smith. It, Nerve damage in the knee. That's scary. What can we ex realistically expect? Can, can he actually going to – is he going to be able to play? I mean, he started to play the preseason, and he's looked pretty good. I mean, nothing nothing that's been like, yep, definitely a stud here, but he's looked good. And realistically for Dallas, that's what you want at this point. You just want him slowly bring it along because look at Sheree Floyd. Sheree Floyd tried to rush back from some knee issues, and now it looks like it might cost Sheree Floyd the year his career. It's very, very yeah. similar situation, meniscus problems, causing into nerve damage, which eventually means that the knee can't fire and pivot and explode the way that you want. And obviously when you're in a position like linebacker where you got to change directions quickly and react off of tight ends, running backs, receivers, offensive linemen, what you're seeing, you need to explode quickly. If you don't have that nerve damage and you don't have that explosion, that's a problem. So Jalen yeah. Smith's guy we're cautiously optimistic about, but realistically – the Cowboys didn't spend a first-round pick on him. They got him in the second, so I said, all right, let's see what happens. Fine. You move on the other other linebacker, I mentioned him earlier, Sean Lee. Only a second time in the last six years he's played a full season. That's not yeah. – that's a big, big concern. He hasn't been able to do it consistently. He's done it the last two years in a row, so is the injury concern over for him? I don't know. If it is, that's a huge bonus because Sean Lee is a very undervalued linebacker in the NFL. That said, your, your biggest ability in the NFL is your availability. And if you're not healthy, it means nothing. As bad as that defense is, I mean, he, he's the star. And uh, you lose him, it, it does matter. It does. It's a big difference. So... There you go. Yeah, he's right. he, he, he's probably yeah, the only defensive player on Dallas that I feel confident to put money down that has the ability to be a hundred tackle player. If Jalen Smith is healthy and he shows the ability, then sure I could say him. But Sean Lee's the only player who I really feel confident that could be a hundred tackle level player. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to the secondary. A, a lot of moving pieces and moving parts. Brandon Carr is gone. Uh, Morris Claiborne is gone. They also got uh, – safeties are gone. Barry Church, J.J. Wilcox. Not that J.J. Wilcox is any good, but, you know. Uh, all right, so so Anthony Brown, like you said, that just shows how much confidence that they have in him being a six-round pick. He is your number one corner on this roster right now. They still have Orlando Skandrick, but he's like – not that he, he's not to the extent of Sean Lee, but he's always getting hurt too. So, But he's, he's your number two corner, basically. Well, he's your slot corner. 
Uh, and Nolan Carroll is your starter opposite of Anthony Brown. So that's a problem. The, the corners stink. Anthony Brown is good, but uh, uh, I don't know about the rest of the crew. Well, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of jump in and correct you on something. Now, when we say the starting corner in the NFL, I think Anthony Brown is the best one. I agree with you there. However, what Dallas is going to do, and it's smart, they're not going to put Anthony Brown on the best receiver. They're not going to put him on Odell. They're not going to put him on Terrell Pryor. They're not going to put him on Alshon. They're going to move him away from him. And the reason for that is they're going to run a lot of bracket coverage for that best receiver meaning one low, one high. Low player being a Nolan Carroll as the one safety. The guy who kind of hovers over the top is probably going to be Byron Jones. So essentially what they're going to do is they're going to take their best corner and say, hey, we think you can probably win the matchup against the number two receiver for a lot of NFL teams. And I think that's fair because as good as Anthony Brown was his rookie year, it was his rookie year. So let's not you know make it sound like he's a Pro Bowl level guy either. But they'll run a lot of bracket coverage away, and that's the smart thing to do. So when you have those other guys of Nolan Carroll and Alandra Sendrick, those uh, Sendrick, those are the two guys fighting out to be that other starting spot. But then add in, let me rattle off. The other three guys they have are all rookie guys, you know, all youth guys that they have there, with, with Jordan Lewis being one guy out of Michigan who was the best corner in the Big Ten last year, got drafted late because he had some off-the-field concerns that all ended up getting dropped. And then you have Awuzie, a guy who came out of nowhere last year and played out of his mind from Colorado, big six-foot-one corner. He's more physical while Lewis is more of the speedy guy. You added those two guys to mix. So realistically, Dallas has got three young corners in the NFL. This, this defensive back crew, Adrian, I could argue easily this might be the worst defensive back crew in the NFL, but because they are betting on so much youth with those three young corners, Byron Jones, another guy very, very young, I could argue that if these guys all hit, we could be looking at the best defensive back crew in two to three years, but for right now, a lot of youth. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Byron Jones is, is interesting because I, I feel like I liked him more two, three years ago than I do now. You know, I, I still like Byron Jones. I like him as a, as a free safety single high player. I don't love him when he comes down in the box. I don't think he is nearly as good of a tackler as some people make him out to be. Um, like Obi Mill and Fonwu, everyone can put those comparisons. Obi's a way more yeah. physical player than Byron Jones is. Byron Jones is, is more of the, the true free safety. I am not a huge fan of Jeff Heath as the starting strong safety in Dallas. I know Jay. I like Robert Blake better. I'm sorry? I like Robert Blanton better. I, I don't. Uh, I don't like Robert Blanton at all. In fact, I think actually he got cut from the 53. Um, well, I think Jeff stinks. But that's I'm not a big fan of his. I, I thought he was a fine rotational guy in the NFL. I don't think he was a guy who was really starter. I think Dallas really took a big miss in not jumping all over the opportunity to sign T.J. Ward when he got released from Denver. I thought he would have been a great signing there in Dallas, but obviously didn't work out. I know J.J. Wilcox was far from a stud in the NFL, but I would much rather have J.J. Wilcox as my strong, starting strong safety than any situation that Dallas has there. Yeah. Yeah, Bar Barry Church was actually kind of good for them last year. Yeah, uh -huh. very good year. Yeah, Barry Church had a very good year last year. Yeah, but, you know, he's gone now. All right, so this is where we get to hot seat and all that. So who's on hot seat in Dallas? So my hot seat guy in, in Dallas, I'm going to probably have to go – boy, this, this is actually a tougher one. At first I thought I had a confident – no, you know what, I don't. It's going to be Ezekiel Elliott. And here's the thing. It's not like Ezekiel Elliott's going to lose his starting job in Dallas, but Ezekiel's got to stop being an idiot. I mean, all the stuff he's done, all the stuff that he has, you know, stopped himself from getting on the field is his own fault. Zeke's the only person able to stop Zeke. Now, as far as what I mean by a hot seat – I just mean this is a guy who the NFL is circling and saying, if you keep messing around, you're going to get close to a year-long suspension just for being a dumbass. That's a fucking good point. Terrence Williams, I guess. That's like the easy one. That's easy. Terrence Williams. We can move on. Who's underrated? Oh, I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of, of Ryan Switzer. I thought that was a really, really nice draft pick when they, when they brought in Ryan Switzer. I think he, he was the best return man in the NFL draft class, 
right up there for Dory Jackson, especially in the punts. Ryan Switzer was a little more of a punt returner than a Dory was a true returner all over the field. But I love Ryan Switzer. I love that that option to bring him in there because you know what? If they move on from Terrence Newman, okay, I'm okay with it. Because, I mean, Bryce Butler could realistically go be the other physical receiver starting on the ball and then allow Switzer and Cole Beasley to both be off the ball in the slot. I'll go. Uh, I mean, I know I've talked Malik Collins and, and Anthony Brown a lot, so I won't mention them. I'll, I'll go Bryce Butler, the receiver. I think he's already better than Terrence Williams. Uh, he's shown me a little bit during the preseason. So him being that third receiver, I think, for Dallas fits, because uh, you got Cole Beasley. He's basically your number two, even though he's a slot guy. So I, I, I Bryce Butler would be my guy. There you go. There you go. Uh, fantasy. I'm going to go with Cole Beasley here. Uh, and I say that because where Cole Beasley's get drafted, he's not going to be a guy who's necessarily going to win you a lot of fantasy matchups week by week, but he's certainly going to be a guy who's going to keep you in, and he's going to be a great value. In most fantasy leagues, he's going with below round 14. Realistically, if you look at the guys who are going that low, none of them are going to have 70 receptions like Cole Beasley realistically is this year. So if you're in a PPR league, Getting a guy like Cole Beasley, that's an awesome wide receiver five for your team where you're looking at your fifth receiver and your fantasy team having 70 receptions. Yeah, I'll take that in the 14th, 15th round. I'm okay with that. All right, a double dose of fantasy questions for you, Brendan. Another one. Where should you take Zeke Elliott in your league? Man, this is a tough one because – you're, I mean, you're really drafting with your eyes closed, really not knowing where he's going to be. Yeah. So when you're looking at Zeke, I would probably take Zeke, depending on how big your league is. Now, if you're a massive league, I would be more worried about drafting Zeke early. But if you're in like a 10-team PPR league like most people are, probably say I'm comfortable taking Zeke in the 15th round with realistically understanding that you're probably going to need to take McFadden in the 8th or ninth round because he's probably going to go as like the McFadden will probably be like the hundredth player off your board. So you will need to handcuff him um, there, especially for the first couple of weeks, unless you're in a situation like myself, like I'm in a keeper league. I have a running back as my keeper. So for me, I could go ahead and I might draft Zeke a little, little earlier because I already know I have a star started running back. I think Zeke's probably a top 15 to 20 round pick. Um, but again, realistically, we're drafting with our eyes closed here. You mean top 15 to 20 player or top 15, 20 round? Oh, top 15 to 20 player. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Got you. All right. Because I was like 15th round. He ain't lasted at 15th round. <laughs> no, no, not a shot. I wish he would be, but no, no way he's getting that late. I, went, uh, I had a 12 team t league yesterday and he went with the first pick in the second round. I was considering taking him with ninth pick, but I went with Mike Evans. Yeah, I would take so Mike Evans. I would definitely take Mike Evans over Zeke. Um, but no, I think that, yeah. that first pick in the second round, that's the perfect range for him. Did you – I'm trying to remember. Did you play in the Cap League last year with us? Uh, no, we were, we, you and me were in different leagues last year. Okay. They make fun of me because I'm the guy that drafts all the suspended players. But by the time the suspended players are ready to play and I go two and two – I'm freaking darting and I'm dashing and I won the league last year because I drafted, I drafted Le'Veon Bell and Zeke with my first two picks. Now Zeke obviously wasn't suspended, but, but Le'Veon Bell was. Um, I, now I also, I, I fucked up with Josh Gordon cause he got, he got suspended for the year, but I went and drafted like everybody that was suspended. I started four and oh, <laughs> so I, I, I started four and oh, even though I drafted all these guys and, uh, and I still won the league. But there you go. There's a little story from me. All right. So that's pretty much it. That's Dallas. Oh, you want to get into your schedule? Go ahead. I want to show. I want to show how I have the Cowboys finishing up this year. I have them going nine and seven this year. Now, Adrian, you. Oh, you moved the Giants back to ten and six. I did, and you know what? I realized it was because I made a pretty big boo boo. I had the Giants and the Redskins winning this game. I had them both winning, and I was like, ah, uh, that's mathematically not possible for both teams to win, <laughs> and I'm not going to be that loser to project yeah. a tie. So. I said, all right, I'm, I'm going to give one of these to the Redskins here. By the way, going back to the Cowboys now, all right, so let's say, for example, Zeke is suspended, and I think the minimal suspension is going to be a two-gamer. If he does get the two-gamer, Giants and Broncos, I think the Cowboys will take two losses right off the bat. Those are both two very, very good teams. I think they realistically could lose both of those games. 
Cardinals and the yes. Rams, I don't care if Zeke's not there. I think they win both of those. Packers, that, as you talked about, Adrian, that's a big one. If Zeke's there, different conversation probably. But if he's not, give me the pack for sure. Niners coming back. Redskins, I mean, that's going to be a tough one there. At the Falcons, that's not easy. Then we got a pretty nice stretch here. Eagles, Chargers, Redskins. I think all three of those games are winnable, especially because Dallas gets them all at home. That's a big deal. Going to the Giants isn't easy. These two were tough for me, the Raiders and the Seahawks. The fact that it's in Dallas, I said, you know what, I'll give the Cowboys the benefit of the doubt over the Seahawks. But honestly, with all the moves that Seattle has done defensively, that's hard for me to think about. And in Oakland, I'm not confident about this one at all because realistically at this point, if those young corners do not develop, Derek Carr will light them up. The problem is Raiders' defense sucks. So there's not a great situation. And I think that the Cowboys are going to get an L to end the year with the Eagles. And we'll talk more about the Eagles on our next show. Well – I had the Eagles originally going 